everybody, Justin here. What you're about to watch is just the first video in a series of 10 on this book right here called Letters to the Church by Francis Chan. I get to sit down with my good friend, John Jorgensen. Many of you guys know him from the internet. And we have a longer form conversation around this concept of church. I really love the way that Chan kind of teases this book. He says, we've strayed so far from what God calls church. We all know it. We know that what we're experiencing is radically different from the church in scriptures. And I know that for me, I have felt this way for many, many years. I've been struggling through this idea of church as someone who loves Jesus and who reads the word and says that the church is important. I've gone to church a lot of times on the weekends and I've just been like, why? I don't get it. And so in this series, John and I get to sit down and wrestle through this concept together. I think you're going to find the conversation really, really uh, valuable and enlightening. And uh, the way that this works out is half of the videos are hosted on my channel. The other half are hosted on his channel. So you're going to have to go over there and subscribe to him as well. Uh, and every week we'll both be releasing a new uh, a video or episode in this series. And so we want to journey through this with you guys uh, along the way. If you can't wait to see the entire thing, one way for you to get the entirety of its message all 10 parts at once is to become a patron of either my channel or his channel will be releasing that for free for our patrons. So we are going to be diving into this. Can't wait to, to, to hear your thoughts on this. Be sure to give the video a like, to subscribe, and to share your thoughts in the comment section below. John, it's good to see you, man. It's good been a while you. since we've been in person, but uh, I know. love what you're doing, man. Thanks so much for taking the time to, to join me on this journey as we get to study uh, and look through the book. Uh, what is this? Letters to the Church by Francis Chan. I hit you up a, a couple of weeks ago and said, hey, what do you think about going through this book together? I had heard one of the uh, podcast interviews with Francis Chan talking about his journey, leaving the mega church kind of scene and what God has been leading him into. And I'm really just like stoked to be able to have someone to process this all with. Uh, but I'm grateful that we get to go through this uh, together. Yeah, me too. I, I had a similar experience reading this book as I did when I was in college and read Crazy Love for the first time. Uh, yeah. And uh, I was, yeah, it was that whole like, what? Francis Chan, how do you know these things? <laughs> you can't do that to us. That's not fair. Yeah, come on. <laughs> Why would you convict me in this, in this way? Oh, yeah. But I, I think we've both sort of showed our hand that we overall very much enjoyed the book. Very much so. Uh, but to go ahead and start us this video, uh, I want to ask you the question that Francis Chan actually starts off at the very beginning of his book. Uh, his first chapter is entitled The Departure, and I just, I fell in love with the very beginning. First couple paragraphs blew my mind. So John, I want to ask you the question. Imagine yourself uh, stranded on a desert island with nothing but a copy of the Bible. You have no experience with Christianity whatsoever, and all you know about the church will come from your reading of the Bible. How would you imagine a church to function? And he pauses there. Seriously, close your eyes for two minutes and try to picture church as you would know it. Now, I'm not sure what you thought of when you actually, let me just ask you this. What did you think of when you read this passage? What did you see in your mind's eye uh, when you were picturing the church as the Bible describes it? I think right off the bat, this was one of the more convicting parts of the book for me, because the question asks us to, to say, if you basically, if you were going to create church just off of what you knew of the Bible and nothing else, what would it look like? And I had no answer to that because, that was a tough question. because my, so much of my view of church has just been what I grew up in. It's been what I'm currently in. It's all been almost societal mm -hmm. rather than starting from the scriptures. It, it's more been, I had an experience and an idea of church. And then I just sort of accepted that without ever actually challenging it and, yeah. and putting it up against scripture. Dude, that, that was exactly my feeling. Like I, I actually have to like sit down and think about it more. Like, I feel like I have to read through the new Testament again, just to figure out the answer to this question. So maybe an easier way to start uh, because I, I, I struggle with the answer, uh, just like you. What would church not be like? Comparing what we have today to what you see in the, mm -hmm. in the New Testament, what would you say clearly is probably not what was intended in the New Testament? Yeah, I think um, this institution, mm -hmm. this giant sort of institutionalized 
system is something that even even growing up before even reading this book that was always something that rang false to me or or just uh, inaccurate or, or I, I hesitate to say wrong but just perhaps not what god originally intended yeah not this, god not god's uh ideal perhaps yeah this this very formal you know giant almost a highly political oftentimes system. And I'm not just talking about old fashioned Roman Catholic churches. I'm talking about your everyday mega church, contemporary church that has all of these politics between the senior pastor and the head of HR. You know, yeah. I think yeah. it, those systems sort of exist everywhere within the modern church. Yeah, something that I couldn't help but notice was in the New Testament, almost never does it refer to the church as a place or as a building, almost always mm -hmm. it refers to it as a group of people, a group of believers living out the message of Jesus instead. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that was really uh, convicting for me to sort of think about because while I do not personally work in a church, that's not where I get my salary or, or anything like that, churches are a big part of how I do my ministry and how I make my living, <laughs> yeah. you know? So public like, speaking, oh, well, where... all that kind of stuff. By the yeah. way, shout out if you need a public speaker, John's here, hit him up. <laughs> so is Justin. So is Justin. <laughs> but yeah, I'm like, oh, well, what am I, what am I to do then if this giant mega church with a big budget mm -hmm. <laughs> doesn't exist or yeah. isn't supposed to exist. What, what am I to do? You yeah. know, the, the, the follow up to uh, this paragraph, he goes on to say, now think about your current church experience. Is it even close? So assuming that we could actually define what the new Testament church was intended to be like, he says, is this what you're experiencing? And then the, the, the punchline, this part like gutted me, like, and it's literally on the first page of the first chapter. Can you live with that? I was mm. like, wow, that's so like powerful. Can I live with the fact that when I look at the church as it's typically defined, at least in North America, and when I hold it up to the New Testament, that it seems like they're not even related. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, and th I think this is what something that Francis Chan just does so well. And it is a theme through almost all of his writings that, that I have read, whether it be crazy love or forgotten God or this, he's not, and he says it several times in the book, he's not presenting anything new. He's actually just trying to get us back to basics. Yeah. He's, he's, he's trying, trying to, to get us go back to what the scripture says. Right. And not innovation. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, he's trying to tear down all these things that we have sort of accepted or created on our own and get back to what did God actually originally intend. And, and something that that I sort of thought as I was reading through this, as I was thinking about my current church experience and even church experiences along the way, I think we've all had those like, we need to get back to the roots of the church moment. Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably actually how a lot of modern churches started. They started by wanting to get back to this grassroots act two, acts two spirit led version of it. I think they all started with these pure motives, but then perhaps along the way, they were because of massive growth mm -hmm. or because of demands mm -hmm. of people mm -hmm. or wanting to bring in more people, they compromised yeah. those yeah. original motives. Yeah, I think Chan actually later talks about this in the book, and maybe we'll get this into our, our series as we continue forward. By the way, guys, if this is the first video you're watching, there is a whole series that you'll find linked somewhere. Uh, he talks about like how that's exactly what he started when he first planted his first church. And then he talks about the struggles of trying to buy property and have all these different kinds of staff and just like it grows quickly out of control. And so, so much of it is based on comparison, right? Yeah. Of, well, all these other churches that we're trying to emulate are doing this. Yeah. So I guess we have to do it as well in order to compete in this industry. And, and maybe from a, like an even more like gracious perspective, maybe it's not even competition, but it's like, this is the only thing that we know. Like if you've been yeah. born in America, when you think of church, this is the only model, unfortunately, that we actually see. There's no alternatives, really. That's true. That's true as well. That's maybe a little less cynical than mine. <laughs> not, that you're, <laughs> not that you're trying to be cynical. Um, I, so so let, me, let me say this. Um, I think the most recent statistic that I've seen online say that 59% of millennials, that's you and me, 
uh, when they get to around college age, they end up leaving the church. And then another study said that only two in 10 millennials actually value or, or would consider church like a priority in their life. Um, so my observation with that is the way that we're doing church is somehow inherently flawed. And so I want to know, how do you personally relate to the church? Because I know you online, you know, you run the internet's favorite Bible study. <laughs> Self-proclaimed, that's why I'm making a joke on <laughs> on John. Um, but, you know, you're, you're someone who's definitely very uh, devout, at least in your relationship with with Jesus. But what is your relationship to the church like? Yeah, so I have... I'm at a place, and we've talked about this before, just you and I, mm -hmm. where I feel as though I'm just coming out of a season of a lot of skepticism and anger and resentment towards the church. And a big part of that had its roots in when I decided to start a Christian YouTube channel, when I decided to start doing public ministry, especially in an online space, yeah. because as many of you know, the online space in and of itself is ripe for trolling and people disagreeing with you in perhaps not the kindest way. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, I have found that Christians are usually amongst the worst of that uh, in terms of how we treat each other and how we enter into our quote unquote debates online. And because I had sort of entered into this space and was experiencing a lot of, uh, a lot of that really just hatred and judgment from other Christians, Every time I walked into a, a church on a Sunday or tried to join a church, I, I was projecting all the things that had been said about me online onto the people that were there. Yeah, it's such an interesting like paradox that like the highest percentage of people who troll or are angry or like straight up like calling people names and like very vulgar, at least in my channel online, the vast majority of them are professing believers and that's mm -hmm. so i definitely resonate with that kind of resentment for the church and I, i'm glad to hear that you're emerging from this because i feel like that's actually where i'm at as well i i grew up in the church and my my experience with christianity has always been one of frustration uh the bible was confusing church was irrelevant and boring and 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 yet everyone would 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 always talk about how important this was and i i could never make sense of those two things and so i always felt like there was there like i was being lied to that there was something better out there that was kind of maybe being withheld and so especially when i was in high school i like my constant thought about the church was is this even worth it like should i stick around does this make sense like i i actually would think about the time where i graduated high school and would transition into college should I even continue doing this? Is it worth it anymore? And I think the reason yeah. why I asked that question was because I wasn't experiencing God in my local church in perhaps the way that God wanted me to experience him and, and, and to, to fellowship with him. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the, one of the big reasons that I'm sort of coming out of that season now is because I have sort of found a church that really is is full of people who could not care less about contemporary Christian culture. Uh -huh. You know, they they don't they think that our worship pastor writes all the songs. You know, and like they're cool with that. You know, there's no such thing as like a Christian celebrity or the fact that I have a YouTube channel that people follow. They're like, oh, that's cool that you do that. That's awesome. <laughs> Whatever, Whatever, you know. And and it's very very refreshing to be amongst a group of people who are perhaps they're, they're very, what, what we who are, who grew up in church would call unchurched people. Ah, and interesting. that's, that's quite refreshing that they haven't necessarily been infiltrated with the contemporary Christian idea of what church and Christianity and faith should be. They actually show up with sort of a clean slate. That's awesome. And yeah. And that's, that's really refreshing. It's that's really cool. refreshing. I think that uh, it'd be awesome if more more young people could experience church in that way. Mm -hmm. uh, Francis Chan is uh, writing in this first chapter about some of the challenges of the church model that he helped to uh, propagate. You know, his own physical church that 
uh, if you don't know his story, I mean, he planted a small little church. I think it was in his like living room of his apartment or something along those lines. And he, in, in a few short years, it seemed like his church had blossomed to thousands and thousands and thousands of, of members. But then as he started to wrestle through the New Testament, he was asking himself a handful of questions. And I'll read uh, at least uh, two or three other uh, two or three of these questions. Feel free to like point out the one that, that jumps out to you the most. He, he asked himself, what would happen if he was no longer the pastor? He, with his church board, asking this question, what would happen if his personality, which seemed so crucial to the growth of the church, what if he left? What if he unfortunately passed away or got called to overseas missions or decided to plant a different church? What would happen then? Uh, he asked, uh, what would happen... Uh, uh, how, what would it need to take place so that people would come to experience the Almighty God and the moving of the Holy Spirit instead of coming to hear Francis Chan? And I think that's really interesting. He has like this whole theme of like, it's not about me. And I really like that. Uh, and then one quote that he had that I really thought was uh, really great. He says, I saw a few other people and myself using our gifts while thousands would come and sit in the sanctuary for an hour and a half and then go home. What do you think about all that? So I, I, I had mad respect when I read that those first two, when talking about like, what would this church look like if I wasn't there? Because I think so many churches out there, especially the, the big churches like, you know, Cornerstone was, or, you know, the, the other big mega churches out there. So much of it is based on the fact that you have this incredibly dynamic communicator yeah. up on stage every Sunday. Yeah. And, and not that there's anything wrong with being a dynamic teacher. And, you know, I, like I seek to be a more dynamic and effective teacher, Same. Uh, but there, there is something to, to be said about that. I think there's a line to be drawn between doing the best teaching that you can and perpetuating this cycle of people going around in church shopping, or even for us, like people going around in Christian YouTuber shopping until you find the person that you just kind of like the best. Yeah. Like it, it, then you're just treating church like a TV show or a late night talk show, basically of like, well, I'm not really a James Corden fan. So I watched Jimmy Fallon, you right. know, which that's not really what it's about, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we definitely, at least in North America, and I'm sure other places as well, we view church as, as a commodity. It, there's this consumeristic mentality where church is about what I can get. And, and that's why the speaker, the preacher, is such a crucial part of this current model. And uh, I, I don't know, I, I, I see the fruit of that. Like, I, I know that it's a blessing to me at times, you know, where I can get a great message, but I, I find myself like reflecting that this doesn't quite create the type of character in me that I believe that God is trying to. Because when I mm -hmm. sit in the pew and I find myself thinking, I don't know if you do this. I know that I do this a lot. I, fi I find myself sitting in the pew thinking, yeah, that guy really shouldn't be on stage. Like he can't deliver that message. Or oh, I could preach that sermon 10 times better. Or or like, oh, I know where he's going. And, I, and I'll, I'll even like to, to Emily as we're sitting in church together, I'll be like, oh, he's going to go to John 3 next. Or he's going to yeah. turn to this passage. And then like seconds later, he says that passage. And I was like, what? And like, and I'm like, yeah, I know I could do that better. Like, and, and it's like, it's just like, how is it that when I'm here in church sitting to like worship God and to like get into his word, like I'm thinking about myself more than anything else. Mm -hmm. I find that maybe perhaps this consumerism model uh, is broken or maybe I'm just broken. <laughs> well, maybe both. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> no, I think it's both. I mean, we, we both come at it from a very unique angle in that we are communicators and we're trying to learn how to be better. Mm -hmm. And at my best, I am watching I'm I'm viewing the teaching that's going on with a critical eye so that I can learn how to be a better communicator myself. That's how at my best, at my worst, I'm doing it from a place of pride yeah. and a place of I could do this better. Yeah. Whereas I think the the person who's perhaps not seeking to be a Bible teacher sits there and at their at their best, they're being critical because they're they're just thinking about it critically of how do I apply this to my life and at their worst, they are being critical and judgmental because I don't like this person's style. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? 
I, I love that distinction, and I think it's so appropriate for this entire series. We're going to be going through a lot of really hard-hitting questions and some passages that really challenge us. And uh, one thing that uh, I love about the way that the, the tone in which Francis Chan writes this book, it's it, he's trying so hard to not be overly critical in like the tearing you down kind of way, but also balancing that with we have some real growing to do as a community and as a church. And I, and I love that tension in which he resides in. And so um, it reminded me, and this is kind of be a really weird quote, but it reminded me of a quote from uh, that I think Augustine is, is who it's attributed to. He says, yeah, the church is a whore, but she is still our mother. I was like, whoa, that's intense. I like, I don't know how far I go with that, that, that sentiment, that idea. Sounds but... like something that someone said to me once in middle school to make fun of me. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, <laughs> Yikes. I, I think what Augustine or whoever wrote this thing was trying to say is like, listen, there are a lot of things that we could look at the church and rightfully so be critical. There's a lot yeah. of things that we could very authentically say and point and say, this is wrong. This is, this is not the way God wanted it. We need to do better. But also to still have this perspective that, you know, the church is treasured. It is valuable. This is the eye of uh, the apple of God's eye. And, and so I think it's important for us to try and struggle like Francis Chan is doing to, 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 to speak the truth and to ask the hard questions, but also to continue to uplift the church in the way that God sees the church as well. I hope that episode was as challenging for you guys as it was for me. Of course, this is only video number one in the series. So go ahead and click or tap right over here to take you to John's channel and see video number two. If you would like to see the entire three hour unedited full conversation, you can do so by becoming a patient right over here. But as I like to say, until next time, I'm that Christian vlogger, and I want to encourage you to experience faith in the first person. God bless.